and this new series, Prayers of No Return. We'll talk about what that means here in just a second, but let me reiterate that um, if you're a guest with us this morning, I'd love to meet you. My name is Brad, and um, of course, typically when you, when you leave, you'd go out and turn left. I'm going to go out and turn right, and I'm going to go to the coffee uh, corner right down here at the end of the hall, and I do that so I can be available. So that if you want to talk with me or you need prayer or you want to share about something or just meet me, I'd love to, to meet you down there. And uh, that would be great after the service. Um, we're starting this brand new series, Prayers of No Return, kind of built around a concept that I'm sure many of us are familiar with called the point of no return. Right? It's that point of no return where, okay, we're moving in this direction, but we can still go back at this point. But once we get to a certain point, perfect, perfect illustration. My brother texted me uh, this week. We, we grew up. I'm a huge roller coaster enthusiast. Love roller coasters. Well, Kings Island just built their newest, biggest, tallest, fastest, awesomest roller coaster. And it's opening this summer. And, and, and my, my brother sends me the, the headlines with, a, with like a couple words. We're there! Exclamation point. <laughs> So we're making plans, right? Love roller coasters. But everybody who's ridden a roller coaster understands the point of no return. Right? Click, 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 click. We can still turn back. They can still turn it off. They can still save my life right now. Right? And then you get those last slow clicks. And at some point, there's no turning back, right? Because the train has left the station and that thing is over the hill and you are gone. And, 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 and that's kind of the point of no return. In this series, I want to talk about prayers of no return. And what I mean by that is prayers that when you pray them, when you, and I'm not just talking about saying the words, when you engage with God and you, you are sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're pouring your heart out and you're saying, Lord, this is real, I mean this, when you pray these prayers, they change you forever. There's no coming back from these prayers. Um, Grab your message notes if you don't already have them, okay? I put that in my, my notes right there to remind you of that. Uh, so you can open your bulletin. They're right there for you to follow along. And uh, if you have a smartphone and you're using Uversion, um, it's a wonderful little tool. You can go to your app store and get it for free, Uversion Bible. But if you open that, you go to the bottom right and click on More. And then you open Events, and boom, we'll be the first one there. You can take notes on, on your phone as well. Follow along. All the scriptures are in there that we're going to talk about, and there's some questions at the end of it to follow along and have a small group talk about how to live this out uh, afterward. Okay, so we got our message notes, and we want to talk about this. Um, well, actually, I want to tell you a story. 1987. Some of you know my story of coming to Christ. Um, I was 20 years old, and I had hit hit rock bottom and I went out to Wichita and, and landed in this community of people who just loved on me and I surrendered my life to the Lord and there's this one prayer that I prayed uh, one time I came to youth group and this will tell you a little bit about the time that this youth room was, was built we, it was a big giant open uh, room about the size of class 105 if you've been over there and that was our, our youth space and it was covered in lime green shag carpet <laughs> it was awesome right so we show up there, and I just laid on the floor. I remember I walked in there early, and I just laid on the floor. It was in the middle of summer, and I had on my, my, my you know, skater shorts that were a thousand colors, and my ripped up t-shirt, and I had this blonde, permed, long hair. <laughs> and I just laid on the floor on my back, which was my custom, and um, we started to pray. So really, I love this youth group. It was just really committed to the Lord, man. These guys were awesome. And we started to pray as the Spirit led us. And I said, God, I don't know what tomorrow holds for my life. I don't know where I'm going. I'm 20 years old, right? This is before my brain tumor. Right? This, was, this was eight months before my brain tumor. I said, God, I don't know where my life's going. All I know is I'm so glad I know you. I'm so glad I found you. God, I totally surrender my everything to you. My days, my life, my 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 career, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want of me, God, I give it all. I just want you to have everything, every part of me. Whatever you want to do with me, God, I am yours all the way, 100%. And I'm just trying to remember how that prayer went. But it's interesting, I get together with my, my cousin, who was part of that youth group, uh, and, you know, it was like 30 some years ago, and whenever we talk, that, that'll come up and she'll say, man, I remember when you prayed that prayer. 
just thinking, man, God is going to do something there. Um, because sometimes when you have those moments and you pray those kind of prayers, I, I was never the same. And that's what I'm talking about. These, these moments of just surrender to God in an area. Real quick, I'll tell you where we're going. Next week, we're going to talk about a prayer that goes like this. God, transform my life. Transform my life from what it is to what you want it to be. From the inside out, my mind, my thinking, the way I look at my relationships, my marriage, my finances, my relationships, you know, whatever, everything about my life. God, help me to live the life that you want me to live. Transform me. I give you permission. I surrender to you. The week after that, week three, we're going to talk about, God, show me how to have real, authentic relationships. That's so important in life. We all long for real, trustworthy, faithful friends. Friends who know us. Friends who love us. Friends who we know love us. Friends who we know love us enough that they can get in our grill when they need to. We need friends like that. I, I, you know, who, who, and we know they love us when they do that. People we can pour our hearts out to and trust them and they can trust us. And one of the things I've learned is that in order to have friends like that, you have to be a friend like that. So we're going to talk about that in, when, uh, in two weeks. And then the last week, we're going to pray this amazing prayer that Isaiah prayed. Or talk about praying it anyway. Challenge you to pray it. In Isaiah chapter 6, hear my Lord, send me. Lord, wherever I am, wherever I find myself, I want to be your ambassador. I want to be your hands. I want to be your feet. I want, to, I want the mouth, the, the words that I speak to glorify you. God, send me for your gospel wherever I work, live, or you know, find myself. Um, I'm telling you, when we pray those kind of prayers, it'll change your life. Today we're going to pray, maybe, maybe, I, it's hard for me to say one of them is my favorite, but this one is right up there. God, break my heart for the lost. Break my heart for the lost. It's, it's too easy to come to church and to kind of theologize. Yes, people need Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Amen, brother. Amen. But to never really be broken about it. Where it messes us up inside. Where we can't just go about our day in a normal way. Where we have to pray. Where we can't just go to work and sit beside that person that we don't have a clue where they stand with the Lord without seeking to build a relationship with them and let, give the Holy Spirit a, ch a chance. I mean, where we truly are changed and because we see people the way God sees them. God, break my heart for the lost. Uh, part of our, our mission statement is reach, right? Reach, teach, connect, and send. I'm talking about reach today. Reach, we, we kind of flesh it out like this. When we, when we say we want to reach people, we're saying we want to call people to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord. We, it's not just come, say a prayer, and get wet. It's step out of living for this world and give your allegiance and your heart 100% for the rest of your life as a disciple to the Lord of Lords and follow him and know him and live with a sense of mission for the king right? 1976 a good year if you remember it some of us weren't even here in 1976 there was a much younger Hillier Duke most of you know Hillier and Ruby. Some of you may not, but Hillier was the founding minister who planted the church here. And in 1976, Hillier was wrestling with the call to plant a church here in Cookville. He probably had settled it by that time, but, but that's the year that things got started. And in that year, I know that Hillier bowed his head probably several times. Here's a conglomeration of how those prayers might have gone. Lord, if you're calling me to plant a church here in Cookville, I'm in. I'm in. The roller coaster has gone over the hill. There is no turning back. I am yours, God. Whatever I need to do, break my heart. Help me to be willing to do, go, say, work, whatever I need to do in order to help people who don't know your son come to know him. A savior in Jesus name amen now I'm not sure that's verbatim exactly how he prayed but I bet it captures the sentiment 
of what he was lifting up to the Lord. And when you pray a prayer like that, God hears it. And when you mean it, you'll never be the same. And that's what I'm talking about today. Each of us coming to that place of saying, Lord, wreck me for you. Break my heart for the people that you died for and that your heart's broken for. Many of us know this story way better than I do. You remember the very first service above Nichols Jewelry in 1976 downtown. Right? You remember that. You were there. Many of you were part of the groundbreaking service here at 780 Fairground in 1978 when we first started construction on this facility, phase one, which I think this was phase one, and then there were other phases. You remember that. You remember the excitement and the sense of mission and the, and the idea that we were on a mission for God and that we're building something so that people can come to know Jesus Christ. Many of you made your decision to follow Jesus in this place over the years, over the course of the ministry here. And many of you have seen many others come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior in this place. Friends, what an awesome heritage we have. Because one man prayed a prayer and then a lot of other people joined in and began to pray that same prayer. Lord, break our heart for the lost. It's awesome. And it is a fantastic uh, heritage. We're standing on some really incredible shoulders. But today, we, we stand at a bit of a crossroads. It's been more than 40 years since First Christian Church was birthed. 44 to be exact, coming up. Um, 40 years in the Bible is a generation. That's a very interesting number. 40 years in the Bible is a generation. In the scriptures, every generation is called by God to find their own voice. To pass the faith that they've received on to the next generation. Read the book of Judges. They didn't do that very well. That's the whole problem with the cycle of, 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 of you know, uh, God's, God's uh, goodness and lifting them up. And then they forgot. And they didn't pass it on to the next generation. And they went right back into that cycle. Every generation is called to find their own fresh vision for what it looks like to reach their next generation. With the gospel. Christianity doesn't just kind of happen. It has to intentionally be passed on. And as awesome as our heritage is, and it is, we have so much to be thankful for in the nucleus of love and the family that we have here and how we care for each other and growing together and studying God's Word and going deeper in the, the Word and all that. And we're going to always continue to do that. But in terms of evangelism, uh, we are at a place where we must find our own voice for the next generation. we got to find our vision. What does it look like to reach the next generation here in Cookville? In short, this is what I really believe we need to do. All of us need to get on our knees, figuratively maybe in our heart, maybe physically. But we need to pray a 2020 version of the same prayer Hillier prayed in 1976. We need to say, Lord, break our heart just like that generation. Move us. Fill our hearts so that we see people the way your son sees people. Help us to be willing to do, uh, be, be uh, uh, um, um, you know, open to whatever needs to happen so that we can reach people for Jesus in this generation. Uh, today's generation I've been doing some study on them. I'm going to share a little bit about that as we go through here. But um, the, the, the young adults of today would be called millennials and, and Gen Z right after them. Um, coming up, they are the, they're the parents with young children today. They're the people that come through the doors of our building every single day dropping their kids off at Noah's Ark. Right? Um, they've grown up in an increasingly post-Christian world. And, and when I say that, I mean that many of the traditional Christian values that we would take for granted and assume everybody knows, they don't have a clue about. 
They don't think in terms of a Christian worldview like we, like many who grew up at least in the church would. They live in a world where information is everywhere and instant. They're drowning in information. There's nothing information-wise that we can tell them that they can't say, hey, Google, what about this? And boom, they've got it, right? They're surrounded by information. They're drowning in information, information and technology, but they're starving for truth. They're starving for a sense of what is real, what is, what is meaningful, what gives their life a real genuine sense of direction. They, generically, they don't give a hoot about the name on the sign outside the front of our building or any church. See, when I grew up, that mattered. If a church had this name on the sign, you could, you could worship there. If it had that name, well, you can't worship there. Anybody remember that? Yeah. And, and that meant something, and I understand why we thought that way, but th- th- that, those days are increasingly, that doesn't matter. What they want to know is, when I walk in the door, am I valued here? Am I cared about here? Am I loved? Are my kids loved? Is truth taught in a, is it wrapped in love? Or is it just somebody kind of preaching at me? Or, or do I see what is preached in the life of the people? Are they loving me? Is, 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 is relationship coming first before propositions and all of that? Can I find community here? Can I find support and friends? Can I find real meaning and direction for my life? Can I find a cause that's big enough for me to give my life to in this place? It's actually a very exciting time to be alive. It's a pretty awesome group of people, really, in terms of their hungers and the things that they long for. Um, They are hungry for what is real. And they are hungry for what is authentic. And friends, that's a softball for Christians. Because nothing is more real or authentic than Jesus. And knowing Him. I want you to think about this. This is a good way to think about Christianity. With the storms that came through. Imagine this. It was an F4, right? One of the, at least, there may have been a couple that came through, but the big one was an F4. And look at the damage that it did and the life that it took. But now... Here's what I want you to understand. In theological terms, there was an F bazillion that has swept down through all of human history and it's called sin. And it's crushed everybody. Everybody is dead because of sin. Okay? Everybody. There are no survivors. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. We're all cut off from the author of life because of our brokenness. So God said, we need Team Rumikon. Only he called him Jesus. He sent, the, the, he, he sent his son. He said, we need to form a search and rescue party. So Jesus got it started and he picked 12. And he trained them how to search and rescue. And he said, I want you to reach out to people and I want you to reintroduce them to what it means to come from death to life. And we're going we're gonna to bring people out of death. We're going to rescue people and we're going to bring them into life. And that's what the church and the gospel is about. And every single person that comes to life through Christ, they become part of the search and rescue team. And so now we continue, all these generations later, to deal with the fallout of that F bazillion sin tornado, and we are continuing to look for people who've been crushed by it so that we can show them the way to come to life. I mean, you get to wake up every day being part of that team. There's nothing more real or authentic or exciting or, or bigger than, you know, a cause big enough to give your life to than that. It's awesome. Uh, and, and I'm telling you, that is the kind of thing that this generation would be super hungry for if they get it. Tom Rayner is, is a fellow that I love to follow. He, uh, he, he used to be either the CEO or the president, something like that, of Lifeway Christian Bookstores, which we're familiar with from our bookstore that just closed. Now he is kind of on his own. He does a consulting kind of uh, mentoring Ministry and a lot of his stuff he does online. And he looks at culture. And he loves millennials and Gen Z and does a lot of teaching on them. And he was talking about a young man that he was talking with uh, about the Lord. And this is just a great example of where they are, okay? He encountered John chapter 14, verse 6 for the first time. 
Never heard it before. Now, in case you're not sure what this verse is, this is where Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's letting them know that he's going to be returning to the Father. He's preparing, you know, going to be leaving. He says, now, but where I'm going, um, you know the way. And Thomas, of course, who really, we call him Doubting Thomas, I think he was kind of the guy that said what everybody else was thinking. And he kind of got branded. But anyway, he said, how do we know the way? We don't even know where you're going. <laughs> and Jesus says this wonderful phrase, I am the way. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now this young man, Tom said, when he read that and he saw that it was words directly from Jesus' lips, he got excited because he'd never heard anyone speak with that kind of clarity and that kind of power. It woke him up. He said, wow, I could follow this guy. Uh, as he was just getting, you gotta, he's just getting introduced to Jesus. He's like, okay. I mean, if I need to know the way, it's Jesus. If I need to know what life is about, it's found in him. If I need truth, I run to him. He's the source. What a beacon. It was so, he was so enthused when he discovered these words of Jesus. That's a snapshot of where this generation, they're hungry. They're looking for it. Jesus also said in John Chapter 4, verse 35. He said, I, I, I tell you, open your eyes. And he's speaking to us who are already part of the search and rescue team, right? We're already in. He says, open your eyes. Look at the fields. And he's saying, look at your community. Look at the people around you who live beside you and who you work with and who are in your circle of influence. He said, they are ripe for the harvest. They are longing for truth. They are longing for meaning. They are longing for love. They are hungry for those things that the gospel gives them. Tom Rainer also said this. This is so amazing. He, he, he does this survey of, of thousands of people across our country and, and asks these questions. And one of the conclusions was that uh, among the people that were surveyed, the 80% of them said, I'd go to church if somebody had just asked me. <laughs> I'd go to church if somebody had just asked me. 80%. And then from there, it goes up to like 90% if we are willing to say, hey, you don't have to walk through the front door by yourself. I know you never entered the building. I'll meet you in the parking lot. And then it goes up to like 100% if they say, I'll pick you up. <laughs> they'll go. They'll come. Just let that sink in. Think about your week and your day and who you work beside and who you see every week. And then just think, I'd come. I'd come if they just asked me. Wow. This is what Jesus was talking about. The fields are ripe. The fields are ripe. Uh, this morning, uh, thousands. This bothers me. I hope it bothers you. Thousands of people in Cookville are not in church. And they don't know Jesus. They, they don't know him. But they're hungry for all the things we just described. They want meaning in their life. They want direction in their life. They want truth in their life. They want to know that they're loved, that they matter. They want all the things that the gospel offers. Again, this is why Jesus says the fields are ripe. Our staff and our elders, I'm so excited about this. You just don't know. I've been in ministry a long time. And it, it, it's, I, I've never had a group of elders and staff who want to pursue this like these guys. I love it. Our staff and our elders, we have been prayerfully seeking God for his vision for, for FCC. Today, where do you want us to go from this point forward, God? How do we reach this generation? What are we supposed to do? We've studied, we've been reading, we've been praying, we've been talking and having lengthy discussions. We're going to continue to do that this afternoon at 4 o'clock. We're going to continue to meet and pray and talk and seek God for his vision for this church. And the really cool thing is that God is starting to answer. We're starting to get a little bit of a sense of some things that He wants us to do moving forward in order to reach 
I call them pre-Christians in Cookville. They're going to be, they just don't know it yet. Right? He's kind of laying out a little bit of a game plan for what he wants his people to do in terms of search and rescue. It's good to have a leader when you're in a search and rescue team. They kind of say, no, stay away from there. Make sure you go over here. These are the most important spots. And we're just trying to follow our leader in how to do this. Um, here are two, two of those thoughts that, that are starting to come up in our heart, okay? Pray, because we're all in this together. One of the things that God is laying on our hearts is that we need to refocus on local mission. Local mission. Right here, backyard, right? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said this five minutes before he ascended into heaven. These are some of the last words he said to his disciples. He, and he was in Jerusalem when he spoke these words. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Translation, we call this the concentric circles of evangelism. In other words, hey, see where you're standing? It's going to start right there. Bloom where you're planted. Okay? You're going to get the Holy Spirit. doesn't mean you have to leave there and go 500 miles away to start. Start where you are. Evangelism starts in your backyard. It starts in your neighborhood. It starts on your street. It starts where you work. It starts where your neighbors are. Right there. Okay? And as a church, we want to do that. God is calling, revive our focus. How can we reach this community where we live? What does that look like? That's why we, we, we've reworked our mission statement. It used to be changing relationships, and that's nice. And, and we want to continue to help people step into a relationship with Christ and all those things. But, but here, here here's, this is much more focused. That's why our new mission statement says, making disciples, that's a very intentional word, in Cookville in Putnam County and to the ends of the earth. So we're always going to be trying to push the gospel as far as we can. But a renewed focus on what's going on right here. It's, it's about an intentional. We're, we're, we're beginning to embrace an, an intentional attitude of looking at what we're doing and how we're doing it. Looking at our budget. Does our budget reflect an effort to reach Cookville and to train people and to make an impact there? What about our programs? The events that we have on our calendars, our ministries, our approach to those, our use of technology in terms of our, in terms of millennials and Zs. This is normal to them. This is their normal language of, in terms of media and technology. Are we using it wisely? Um, social media. I just got to praise Josh and Jared and Scott. They, I, I can get on Facebook and put a post up there. I don't have a clue how it works. <laughs> These guys do. And we're starting to learn, you know, it's not just about pushing events out there. Here's what's happening. No, we're learning. This is a world where our target, our, our, the, the, our mission field, this is where they live. They engage. We're learning how to engage and love and do ministry and the beginnings of building a relationship with people out there. It's, all, it's about all of that. We're trying to put everything through the filter of, Lord, is what we're doing focusing on local, what we're doing right here? Are we achieving this mission of reaching people in our own backyard? Are we doing it right? So powerful. It's something that's just, it's just strong. Another one is a revival of a missionary mindset. A revival of a missionary mindset. Mindset. Now, uh, let me just say a real quick word about the fourth class in our, our Next Steps class uh, series, which I hope that you will take, called Witness Training. A couple weeks ago, we, we taught it for the first time in class 105. We had a, it was packed. There were 37 people in there. And God showed up. It was really cool. We talked about having a mission mindset, building relationships intentionally with people in your circle of influence, just being present serving them, loving them, and giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity to open doors to invite or share, talk about Christ, or let the gospel be come forth. Um, it was awesome. And, and, and so that would almost be like 20% of our church walked out of that room committed to shining for Jesus. It's awesome. God is moving among us in this way. Um, Paul so, so um, just personifies what a missionary spirit or mindset is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. He said, this is, this is how Paul lived his life. I try to find common ground with everyone. 
right? I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything that I can to save some. So, so when Paul met somebody, it wasn't, hey, I already know what, what's wrong with you, and I'm going to give you the three-point solution to your life. How many of you would respond to that? It's like, get away from me. You don't even know my middle name. You don't know anything about me, right? No. Paul said, I'm going to be quick to listen, slow to speak. I'm going I'm to take time to say, hey, what do you like to do? What are your felt needs? What do you enjoy? Where are you coming from? What are your passions? Because I, as I get to know you, I find ways to befriend you and, and to be kind to you and genuinely, not in, a, not in a fake way, but genuinely to just serve and care about you as a wonderful human being created in God's image. Because I know that as I find common ground and, I, and we spend time together, the Holy Spirit who loves the lost way more than we do, He's going to open doors for us to share something from our story about Jesus or invite somebody to a small group or, or, or whatever. There's going to be a moment when we can make that, 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 that statement or oh, I'm going to pray for you about that or whatever and begin to build toward an evangelistic moment. See, we're, 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 God is calling us to learn about this culture called millennials <laughs> and, and, and Generation Z so that we can more effectively reach out to them. Now, here's the really interesting thing about all this. If we had a missionary come and they were talking about Zimbabwe, this is exactly the stuff they would talk about. Let me tell you about how when we flew to Zimbabwe, these are some of the things we learned that were different than what we were used to. And, and it took time for us to learn their felt needs and the things that they valued and the things that we ought not say because they you know, they took that offense to that and, and we had to take time to get to know them and build relationships so that then we would be able to share and communicate the gospel with them in a way that made sense. And we'd all say, oh, of course, that's what missionaries do. Well, guess what? We are missionaries to Cookville. That's just what we are. I mean, we, we, a couple of weeks ago, we, we went through First Peter in, 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 in small groups, and he told us, this world is not your home. You're aliens and strangers. You're sojourners. You are passing through. Your citizenship is in heaven. And so we already have kind of a different way of looking at what life's about. And so now we're talking about dealing with people who've grown up in a post-Christian world. We've got to get to know who these people are and what they care about and what they value. And so we're on that journey of seeking to get to know that. Here's just a couple of the more things that we, we've learned about millennials, and, and it just carries over to Gen Z. Um, this is really interesting. Boomers always loved big crowds. Bigger is better. When, 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 if, you, if you fill this room, build a bigger room. That's, that's boomers. Uh, or, or Even Xers. I'm an Xer. I, if I'm confusing you with all this generation language, just... Just, just understand that the, the generation we're talking about now was born, millennials would be born between about 1980 and 1990, end of the 1990s. And Generation Z would come right after that. Okay? Um, so some of them are even like in their 30s, would you say. But anyway, they, this group, they prefer smaller. They prefer smaller, more intimate venues. This would be I was talking with my daughter about it last night. She said, this would be a good size venue, but not a whole lot bigger. They feel lost. They, they like small, and that's, that's important for us to understand going forward. They deeply value genuineness and authenticity. They, 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 they can't stand fake in relationships. They are deeply hungry, as I've already said. They are deeply hungry for truth when it's presented in a context of loving relationship. Deeply. But that relationship has to come first. That's so important. Um, technology and media is, they, they, they came out of the womb using it. It's just how they talk. It's how they communicate. You know, why should I get out of my bed and go to the basement to talk to someone when I can just text them? <laughs> it's probably not far from the truth. I mean, and I'm not saying that's all good. It's not even about whether it's right or wrong. It's about this is who they are. And we got to learn that so that we can be, Jesus said, be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. We got to be wise in, in, in the way that we approach that. Um, 
this is an exciting time because this generation is primed and ready for a real authentic message about a real authentic savior Jesus uh, God is, is calling us to dive into this and to pursue this and go after it and I am so excited about the journey and I hope that you are too because the fields are indeed white and ripe for harvest as Jesus said and so I just want to close by challenging you to, to write down some form of this prayer and pray it this week some form of this Lord speak to my heart and break me for the lost break my heart for the lost for this generation help me to be willing to learn to pray to serve to support to do whatever I personally can do and also to help my church family to reach this generation for Jesus Christ write down your own version of that prayer and hold on to it and pray it in a way that you can never come back from and let's go together on this journey with Jesus of reaching this next generation let's pray Father how blessed we are those of us who know Jesus in this room how blessed we are to be among those who have been salvaged <laughs> those who have been found those who have been given the gift of a new life help us to realize that that new life comes with a call to share it with those who don't have it yet break our heart God in a great way may we never live a totally comfortable day for the rest of our days as long as there are people out there who need to know Jesus may we ever have names and faces coming to our mind that we are lifting up most exciting life I can imagine living partnering with you Lord in the mission that your heart burns for every day help us to uh, partner with you in that Lord if there's any here today and maybe some today are saying hey I want to know this Jesus I want, I want to follow him may they come today and declare that um, but whatever we need to say yes to today God help us to, to uh, surrender to you in this moment in Jesus name Amen